Hi everyone. My name is Stephen Downs. I work for the National Research Council of Canada here in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. I'm a researcher. I'm a digital researcher. I specialize in online learning, e-learning as it's called. I've developed things like MOOCs and e-learning 2.0 and worked on digital rights management learning objects. Today I want to talk about my method or my lack of method if the case may be. The title of my talk is Against Digital Research Methodologies. I'm borrowing a title from Paul Firebin, who I'll talk about in a bit. But what I want to do is I want to talk about the kind of research that I do. First of all, though, some caveats. Here are my caveats. First of all, it's not even on the page. I'm not an expert. I'm, I haven't researched all kinds of digital research methodologies. I've done my reading, but you know, it's not a specialization of mine by any means or any stretch. So maybe there's a better way to do it than I'm doing it. It's hard for me to say. This is not a prescription of the way you should do your research. I don't really believe in doing that much. Uh, this is a report. This is me talking about how I do my research. And I'm not arguing to the effect that this is the best way to do research, that even this is the best way for me to do research or anything like that. All I'm doing is explaining as well as I can the process that I follow and what I'm thinking about when I'm doing what I call my research. And I'm not even explaining it in the sense that you can generalize from it and prescribe it to other people. I'm explaining it in the sense that if somebody asked me, what is it that you do really? This is what I would tell them. My education began, as yours probably did, with the traditional view of research and academic research and scientific research in particular. The traditional view is what we today call the scientific method. It dates back to Sir Francis Bacon, who tried all kinds of things, including stuffing his hands into frozen chickens, from which he eventually died. And it's based around the idea of inquiry, where you begin by asking a question or posing some problem, or is there some urgent thing that you're trying to solve? And then you do your background research, you do your reading, scan the literature, our papers, the academic papers, I always have a section, the, the lit review, right? And then based on that, you construct a hypothesis. Notice you haven't even really done a whole lot of looking yet, but you construct a hypothesis. Frozen chickens are dangerous. Holes would not form when I walk in the sidewalk. Things like that. And then you test your hypothesis by doing an experiment. And what you've done is you've created a generalization of some sort, and now you're going to use that generalization to make a prediction, and then you go out into the world, set up the conditions to match your generalization, and see if your prediction comes true. The most famous of this, of course, was when Einstein was trying to prove the theory of relativity, and he predicted that light rays would bend when they went around the sun, and they sent some astronomers to the South Pacific on one of the expeditions of James Cook's and they looked up, well they didn't look directly because it was very dangerous, but they looked up and saw that indeed the light rays bend around the sun which you can detect during an eclipse which is what they went to go see. So you analyze your data, normalize it, regularize it, that's not really a word, and draw a conclusion from it. Yes, my, my hypothesis was verified. No, my hypothesis was falsified, etc. This model is pretty much the core of most research methods, not methods, methods. Even in design research, observational research, qualitative research, and various other types of research that I've looked at, they all involve some kind of balance between theory and observation. Where you have some theory of some sort, you do an observation of some sort, 
even if it's an observation doing using your hands and engaging yourself in the data or if it's action research where, you, where you're actually carrying out some program or activity even all of those involve the theory part, the data part, the hypothesis part, and bringing it all together in some sort of analysis. This is originally known as the HD method, or hypothetical deductive method, and it has its origins in the rise of empiricism, or the study of science based on empirical observations, observations using the senses and instruments, from the mid-1800s. In the mid 20th century, it was updated by people like Karl Hempel and Karl Popper and other people from a school of philosophy known as the logical positivists into something called the deductive nominological method. And the best way to describe that method is what, with what Charles Sanders Pierce called abduction or what we would call today inference to the best explanation. And that is to say, you have a phenomena or set of phenomena and what you're trying to do is look at that phenomena and infer to what the best explanation is for the existence of that phenomena. You know, it's like Robinson Crusoe on his island and he's walking along the sand and he sees a footprint. All kinds of things could have caused that footprint. But he looks at it and he infers that there must be another person on the island because the best explanation for a footprint is the existence of a person to make that footprint. You can even generalize that into scientific theories about footprints and people, right? People make footprints or all footprints are caused by people or all non-random, non-obviously artificial footprints are caused by real non-artificial people or some such thing. Now I want to be clear because I've sounded pretty skeptical so far, I want to be clear that my own outlook is empiricist. I am an empiricist. What that means is I believe, quite strongly in fact, that observation and experience are the foundation of knowledge. And indeed, I go further and I say explicitly that there is no, as they say, synthetic a priori. What that means is we can't know about the world without experiencing it. And there's no knowledge that we have about the world that was not generated originally from some sort of experience. This is a philosophy maintained by the English philosopher from the 1700s, David Hume. And quoting from Wikipedia, Hume maintained that all knowledge, even the most basic beliefs about the natural world, cannot be conclusively established by reason. Rather, he maintained, our beliefs are more a result of accumulated habits developed in response to accumulated sense experience. It's this latter part of the quote that really distinguishes Hume from the logical positivists. There's something very different between a habit and a scientific theory. And in the end, while I'm an empiricist, my belief about the nature of science falls more on the habit side and less on the scientific theory side. And a big part of this talk is to explain why. Now, it's a funny thing, I, I just wanted to throw this in here, about experience and skepticism. One of the examples we've always used, we use frequently, to bolster the doctrine of empiricism is a statement like all the knowledge in the world may tell you that the ground is not going to open up and swallow you but you carry on as though it won't but you cannot you cannot know for sure that the ground won't open up and swallow you. And of course, you know the, the rationalists will say, "No, you can know this for sure. It's not going to happen. You can be one hundred percent sure." And the empiricist very carefully takes his next step because the empiricist never knows. Well, of course, through habit, we come to be accustomed to the idea that the ground will be there under us. 
But it's quite amusing to me that recently there has been a spate of people falling into holes that suddenly opened up underneath them. That's a bit of an aside. I've put some people falling into holes videos into this presentation just for fun. Anyhow, back to empiricism. Back to logical positivist empiricism. This is a picture of a guy called Willard Van Orman Quine, who also wrote in the mid-20th century. One of his major papers was titled, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. And here are the two dogmas. First, the idea that there is, <clears throat> as they say, a principled distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions. I'll come back to that. And second, that reductionism is true. Now, this takes a bit of explaining. Analytic propositions are like propositions of mathematics or logic. They are, as we say, true by virtue of being true. 1 plus 1 equals 2 is an analytic proposition. Synthetic propositions are propositions about the world. They represent a state of affairs. So the grass is green is a synthetic proposition. Uh, trees grow in forests is a synthetic proposition. Now, positivism is the theory that the structure of our knowledge is based on analytic propositions and the content of our knowledge is based on the experience. And so you set up the structure with language, logic, mathematics, etc. And you express your truths in this structure in general terms. F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, etc. And then you fill these generalized propositions with what they call sense data or reports from observ observational experience. So you can go all the way down to this patch is red, but you know, scientists they have more precise instrumentation and they can skip some of that. So, you know, they say, you know, the weight of this molecule is or, or etc. And it's not a Humean point of view, but it's certainly a positivist point of view that science can divide these two types of knowledge. So you get the structure and you get the propositions. And even in today's modern, newfangled, model, theoretic based picture of science, you still have this distinction between the model and the reality. Uh, the experience and the rationalist, rationalist structure. Quine says, there is no principle of distinction between these two. I take this further. There are no analytic propositions. Our analytic propositions, to my mind, are shorthand for our experience. This is a philosophy that John Stuart Mill held. He held, for example, that a universal generalization, all men are mortal, all men are mortal, it's a little hard to say, is shorthand for the observation that every man so far has in fact died. And also shorthand for our belief that, or our prediction that, the rest of them alive today will die. But there's no general principle out there like some sort of platonic ideal that all men are mortal. Okay, the other one that reductionism isn't true is this. The idea of reductionism is that every meaningful proposition in language, uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4, grass is green, etc., can be reduced to a set of statements about sense data, that all of our propositions reduce to empirical experience. And that sounds like a tenant of empiricism, doesn't it? It sounds like it has to be true if empiricism is true. But in fact, what Quine is saying, reductionism might not be true. Doesn't mean it isn't. Doesn't mean it is. It means the question is open. And I believe that as well, which may sound odd when I say all of my experience comes from, or all of my knowledge comes from experience, but not all of my propositions can be reduced to experience. But what we'll see is I'm adding a lot into those propositions. 
So taken all together, what this means to me is you cannot even state a theory, much less find one. And that really throws a curveball into our whole world of the hypothetical deductive model, the deductive nominological model. If I can't even express a theory, how could I prove one? Maybe I'm not trying to prove a theory. Me, I think that the idea or the concept of science trying to prove theories, where a theory is a generalizable statement about the world, is importantly wrong. Indeed, even where we take the concept of theory as being not just simply a statement about the world, but a model of the world or some such thing, a representation of the world, as Fodor might say, I still think it's mistaken. From uh, a couple of, uh, from a Dutch scientific method and belief, we see four, if you will, fallacies of theory. One fallacy is the elusive truth fallacy. What distinguishes sense from nonsense? If you think about it, it takes an awful lot of overhead to distinguish between mass and witches, or gravity and goblins. A lot of science can seem a lot like nonsense. I, I want to be careful about how I say this, because I don't want to say gravity has the same epistemic status as goblins. That would be ridiculous. But at the same time, what I want to say is there isn't a principled way of telling the difference between the two. That the same method that you use to talk about gravity is the same method you could use to talk about goblin. And what distinguishes goblin from gravity in our mind is a whole bunch of methodological, procedural, even, you know, as Feyerabend would say, even power plays and, and authoritarianism-based strategies. It's better for the economy that it be gravity than goblins. So there's a lot. There's a big story behind that and not a simple sense of, well, we just know what sense is. We just know what nonsense is. Second thing is theory-laden data. And you've probably all seen that video of the men playing basketball and you're supposed to count the number of times people pass the ball from one to the other. And as you're watching that, a gorilla walks in the background and the question after was, what color was the gorilla? And of course, nobody even saw a gorilla because you see what you're looking for. And this isn't just something that people do casually when they're watching a video on YouTube, this is something that actually infuses into science as well. There's a, a famous uh, experiment, the Millikan, Millikan oil drop experiment. And if you're wondering why they use oil drops, it's because water drops didn't behave properly. And if you look at how they analyze the data, there's a whole process of screening the data to make sure it fits the theory. And this is described by people like Imre Lakatos and others. A third problem of theory is the whole concept of incommensurability and paradigms. And this is, a, this is an interesting one. Uh, you're probably familiar with Thomas Kuhn and the theory of scientific paradigms. And every once in a while you have a scientific revolution and the paradigm changes. Well, part of what Kuhn had to say is that Statements that are true in one paradigm are literally meaningless in another paradigm. Now, what does that mean? It means that a person in one paradigm cannot understand, much less verify or falsify a statement from another paradigm. A classic example is the case of phlogiston. The early chemical theories, theorists believe that in the process of burning fire, something called phlogiston is emitted. Nowadays, we know that what's happening in the fire is the oxidiz oxidization of the material. 
there is no such thing as phlogiston. So how do you talk about the modern theory of fire from the perspective of someone who believes in phlogiston? How can you talk about whether oxygen is implicated if you cannot explain what happened to the phlogiston and the fact that you cannot explain what happened to the phlogiston falsifies your theory of oxygen. When you live in a different paradigm, you literally see the world in a different way, which means you can see some things and you can't see other things. And the problem isn't in the seeing, the problem is in the theory that informs the way you see. And that wouldn't be so bad if our theories were grounded in truth. But more and more, our theories are not grounded in truth. Truth turns out to be very elusive, as I said at the top of this slide. And what we have now is truth becoming truth by consensus. The you know, nine dentists out of ten recommend, therefore, it's true, right? Uh, most people believe, all rational people believe, etc. These kind of statements are becoming what is true. These kind of statements become the basis on which we accept or reject a theory even for base plausibility. Well, research methods in general, based on this sort of approach, in a certain sense, presuppose their own conclusions. And the, the consequence of that is that they are silent on complex questions. They're silent on the question of whether the experiment even ought to be conducted. They are silent on the question of what sort of options ought to be given to people uh, in learning. They're silent on the question of what subjects ought to be learned. One of my uh, criticisms, I uh, put this in a paper once a while back, of the uh, Cochrane collaboration for medical research, one of the studies talked about you know, reducing infection in war wounds and the different, uh, you know, different methods for treating war wounds. And I looked at that, I looked at a study like that, and it's completely outside the methodology to suggest that you simply don't have a war to begin with. Can't be conceived in that methodology. That to me says there's something wrong with the methodology. So now I, I mentioned Paul Feyerabend earlier. Paul Feyerabend wrote a book called Against Method and, and quoting from uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Against Method explicitly drew the, if you will, epistemological anarchist conclusion that there were no useful and exceptionless methodological principles governing the process, the progress of science or the growth of knowledge. The history of science, it continues, is so complex that if we insist on a general methodology which will not inhibit progress, the only rule it will contain will be the useless suggestion, anything goes. Well, personally, I don't think that's particularly useless. I think anything goes works quite well. It doesn't mean there is no method. Everything you do, you know, logically and semantically speaking, has some method. I'm sitting here talking to you on a video. I'm expressing some method. Is this the best method of doing it? Is this the only useful and exceptionalist method? exceptionalist way of doing it? No, of course not. I can be speaking in French badly, but I could. I could be speaking in Spanish. I need a translator. Uh, I could have my back to the camera. I could be doing this live, not by Memorex, etc. All kinds of ways of doing things. Everything you do is a method. Everything you do can be described in general terms. But whether these general terms give us any sort of useful knowledge, that's a different question entirely. It's this belief that there is one right way, this belief that there is the way to do it, that some people have 
particular access to that way through some combination of reason and rationality that is the error here. Now again, I want to be really clear. I am not arguing against reason and rationality. I think those are pretty good things. What I'm arguing against is that reason and rationality confer authority, and they don't. Experience confers authority, but experience is personal. And so experience confers authority over only the person who had the experience. As, as, as Hume would say, reason is and always ought to be the slave of the passions, where he conceived of the passions as those things that constitute human experience, including the emotions, sense of balance, and in Hume's world, uh, habit, sense of ethics, even a sense of religion. Among the illusions, says this review, which have invested our civilization is an absolute belief that the solutions to our problems must be a more determined application of rationally organized expertise. The reality is our problems are largely the product of that application. It's this whole managerial perspective that you know, organize and reason is, you know, sit there in a room and just think it out and then take it out to the world and apply it. And that whole presupposition of research is, to my mind, wrong. So how does my research change as a consequence? Well, I reinterpret my role as a researcher. I, I don't see my role as, as, I don't see research properly so-called as going into a bunch of books, doing the, the background reading and all of that. Doesn't mean I don't read books. Look, I read books. I read lots of books. I read even more online stuff. You wouldn't believe. But the concept of doing a literature review and extracting some state of knowledge before I actually go do something and experience it is not part of my method. When I do research, I build things, I create things, I try things, I say things, I do things like this video. And it's not based so much on research. And indeed, I was thinking as I prepared these slides, a lot of my research comes after the fact and is in the form of rationalization rather than discovery. The idea that I can go do all this reading and then go look at the world or try things and not be ineliminably biased by what I've read is, is, is prevalent in my mind always. I want to go into things fresh. I want to go into things even a bit naively so that I'm not bounded and framed by what the rest of the world has thought before I look at something doesn't mean I don't take it into account what the rest of the world has thought, but I kind of want to experience things for myself first. It's kind of like when I visit a city. I like to explore the city on my own rather than to be taken for a tour. I know the tour will take me to the best sites, but the knowledge that I gain of the city just by wandering myself is completely unique, and that's what I'm interested in. That's one thing. The second thing is, Users, to me, are no longer subjects. The people out there, the, the objects out there, and all of that external to me, I don't see them as the object of study. Think about this. Right off the bat, I'm setting up some kind of dichotomy when I look at it that way. If I'm doing design re research, I'm really setting up a dichotomy. I'm creating myself in the role of an expert and them in the, self, in the role of, I don't know, plebes, peons, users, whatever. I don't see it like that at all. But even, you know, looking at trees, I look, I'm looking this way a lot because my window is out here and every time I want inspiration, I look out here and I see my trees. And 
even that, where I think the trees are my object of study. I've created this worldview in which there are things external to me, which I call trees, which have an independent, autonomous existence. Look at how much I've built into the concept before I even look at them. I don't want to do it that way. I don't want to create this artificial I-thou distinction. There's this concept of research-led design and, and, uh, and, and some really nice work from Winter. I read, uh, I think it's Jan or Ian Winter. I forgot to put the first name on there, but you can follow the link. I had always assumed that case studies, literature reviews, and ethnographic research were necessary precursors to every well-informed design project I did. Now you, you go out, you do your user studies, your needs analysis, your HCI analysis, and all the rest of it, your data flow analysis, do all that work first, and then you do your design, and then you build whatever it is that you're going to build, and then you try it out. It's the HD method all over again, right? People in the software world call that the waterfall method. And in the software world, they've adopted a much different process, a much more effective process, uh, known as iterative design or agile design, where it's very collaborative, very interactive. You do something, you move forward. You do something, you move forward. You do something, you move forward. And you don't always know where you're going to go at the end. And your design process really is a process of you interacting with the application that you're trying to build. And I see the world kind of that way too. So instead of research-led design, we have the concept of design-led research. And this is Liz Sanders right in here. She has a really nice way of, of, of graphing it. I discovered this today. Again, this is like after the fact research that I've done, right? What I've done is in doing my research for this talk, I went out and looked for papers that supported the view that I already had. I didn't really know what the view I already had was, but this supports it. <laughs> This is pretty, con and the best way of saying it is, this is pretty consistent with the kind of thinking that I have all along. And of course, since Liz Sanders did this before me, she has to get all the credit. And that's fair enough. I don't have a problem with that. But it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, if I had done this sort of research before doing my research, my research would have turned out to be totally different from what it was even though when I look back, this is what best describes the research that I did. I know that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but to me it makes sense. So there's, there's a couple of, uh, couple of axes in this diagram between design-led and research-led on the one hand, and the expert mindset and the participatory mindset on the other hand. And that brings us to ways of categorizing the domain of research. And we find you know, a lot of the traditional kinds of research, usability, testing, human factors, ergonomics, contextual inquiry and all. But as you move more toward the design-led and more toward the participatory mindset quadrants, you get things like generative design research and generative tools. You know, and I think about things like Grasshopper which I've spent who knows how long building, and it's my online research lab, if you will. I'm moving more and more into that upper right-hand quadrant. And as we all know from these kind of diagrams, upper right-hand quadrant is always the place you want to be. So drawing out from that, Sanders describes a number of I don't know, what do you want to call them? Uh, Future-looking, upper-quadrant-looking research methodologies. And so we've got playful triggers, design probes, design documentaries, maybe that's what this is. Uh, mobile diaries, that would be my blogging and all of that. 
and way up in the upper uppermost rightest most corner situate, situated make tools now I searched situated make tools on Google and that's mostly something that Liz Sanders has created but you kind of get the concept right so here, here's a presentation from Salu Liriski on situated make tools and what they do is they situate a study at the workplace so you know it's authentic immersive design which I like and then they ground the designing and the workers explanations of what it is that they're up to and then they scaffold the design of these tools so they're working with these workers the workers say what they're up to and they do a little bit and it helps them they do a little bit and it helps them so the scaffolding is almost like agile design of tools in the workplace good plan i, I like that i like the interaction i like the iterativeness I like the idea that you're getting right in there into the workplace, into the authentic environment and actually doing stuff with people, with their hands, with their work. But it's still not quite what I'm up to. Because I see situating as framing. Uh, to situate is to theorize, really, only with a smaller universe of discourse. When we were theorizing at the beginning of this presentation, we were theorizing about the entire universe, right? All force is mass times acceleration. But when you situate it, you take your universe of discourse and you narrow it down to the workplace and you try to look at what truths apply in that workplace. But you still have the same problem. You're still theorizing about a workplace, sometimes even before observing. And your observation of the workplace becomes more and more over time informed by your theory of the workplace. There's this vocabulary that people use. They talk about looking at something through the lens of a theory. I hate that expression. It's using the concept of theory as though it's a way of seeing something like the workplace more sharply and more clearly. That's what the term lens implies, right? Trust me, I know. But I view the theory as something that, although it does amplify and it does sharpen, it also distorts and renders opaque other aspects. My experience of the world like this is very different from my experience of the world like this. So different, in fact, because if you look at my, my glasses are pretty thick, so different that they really are two different worlds. I see the world the way an impressionist sees the world. To, to me, that's what the world really is. And when I put on my glasses, I see the world through a lens. Now I get all of these theoretical constructs in front of me according to the way someone says it's the correct way of seeing the world and you know there's advantages to both right sometimes it's pretty good just to you know let the world go by in the blurry sort of way and focus on your other senses perhaps you know it is McLuhan said you know the visual sense can be overwhelming can consume all I take off my glasses I close my eyes I listen to radio I'm seeing, perceiving the world completely differently. And it's an important and equally valid way for me to do that. Framing is a, a term from George Lakoff, although it's widely used now. And the idea of framing is that you have, it's almost like a model or representation of the way the world is. And you have a set of statements and indeed a set of concepts or terms and metaphors that to you shape the way you think the world is and metaphors are really powerful metaphors you go back to this whole idea of david hume and habit and custom a metaphor is kind of like a habit or custom a metaphor isn't literally true it isn't a universal generalization but it's a way of saying saying something is like something else. This is similar to that. This will probably behave the way that does. But there's no logical relation between the two. 
It's just you get into the habit. Time is money. There's a metaphor. There's a very powerful thing because now we start thinking like time as though it is like money uh, and has value and can be spent or wasted or worse, stolen. So that's the concept of frames, and, and, and you, you can go into you know, a really detailed analysis of the different frames and the metaphors, as Lakoff says, the metaphors we live by. What I want to make the point here is that situating our inquiry in an authentic environment, there's a certain aspect to that which is framing the discourse. Think about you know, the whole concept of situating it in the workplace. Think of all the connotations of workplace when you say workplace right it's not a play place it's not a fun place it's a place where you give time and get money right um you know your understanding of the place changes if you call it a sandbox i don't want to bring that pre-analysis to my understanding and my working with whatever it is I'm working with. I want to move beyond theory in my work. I want to design and do everything else without theory. And to me, that's discovery. Now, what you see on the slide there, that's a picture. I took that in Lisbon, Portugal, as opposed to the other Lisbon, I suppose. Uh, quite enough, well, 10 years ago now. And uh, it's titled The Age of Discovery, and it's a huge statue at the entrance of the harbor in the Tigris River. And I, I love this. Um, the sailors that were inspired by Prince Henry, that's the guy at the prow, who never actually did sail, uh, at least not on any of the voyages of discovery, but he's known as Prince Henry the Navigator. And it's interesting because you know, they, they had some idea of what the world was like, but their theories were so wildly wrong. It, it's, it's interesting. But really what they did is they moved beyond theory. You know, as soon as they passed by the shores of Europe, they've moved beyond anything they know. And at that point, it becomes anything goes, right? Move forward, move with the wind, avoid the dragons if you find any, uh, interact with the people there, uh, go as far as you can. If you can't go further, turn back and try to make your way home. And that's the approach that I take to science. And the other part of it is, you know, when I see myself as an explorer on a small wooden ship on a very large sea, I understand that I'm seeing only a small part of what's going on. And no matter how powerful my instruments get, it's a pretty big universe. And I'm still only ever going to see a small part of what's going on. And at that point, it becomes an act of hubris to bring theory into the picture. My understanding of the world has to be based on something different. This is a slide I used to show a lot. I don't show as much anymore. It's uh, a cave painting from a, a cave in Kakadu in Australia. It was made by Aboriginals who knows how many thousands of years ago. And if you look at it, it's a fish. And if you look at it more closely, it's actually fish guts. And I've used the slogan, we see the future in the same way that we see the past, by reading the signs. And I think this captures my dislike for theory, because I don't see the world as neat and ordered, everything nice and sliced and diced, the way our... our affection for theory presupposes. Now, what a miraculous coincidence it would be if the world really did run according to mathematical principles, which could all be known ahead of time. I won't believe in such coincidences. I don't see the world as neat and ordered. I see it as messy, complex, unknowable in certain ways, ineffable in other ways. 
like a language, even deeper than language, like, like, like a culture. And my understanding of language is the Wittgensteinian understanding of language. Meaning is use. What I mean by a word is the way I use it. What I mean by a theory is the way I use it. What I mean by an observation is the way I use it. My scientific theory is literally my interaction with the world. There isn't anything over and above that. You might think, and I do, of scientific method then as a kind of literacy. Being a scientist isn't all about forming theories and testing hypotheses. Being a scientist is just being a really good reader of the world. Where, you know, you're just reading, you know, it's like you're reading the, the, the world's journal, the world's diary, and you're reading one page at a time, and you get some words, you get some images, and you're trying to infer to their deepest inner drives and emotions. And you know you can't. But it becomes an exercise of interpretation, adaptation, uh, you know, reading the next word as it comes without trying necessarily to predict what the next word will be. Because, you know, predicting the next word when you're reading a book is really the point of reading a book. So what we call theory, in my mind, is just one aspect of world literacy. And it's not even the most important aspect. I've tried to describe these literacies in another uh, presentation, speaking a lol cat, and that's my cat, Bart, who I try to read all the time <laughs> and has his ways. And so borrowing from Charles Morris, the logical positivist, who predated people like Hempel and Popper and the rest, and Jacques Derrida, and even a little Lao Tzu, I look at reading the world as divisible into these six major literacies. Now, I don't run my world according to these six literacies, and you shouldn't either. These literacies, the breaking apart, is simply a heuristic device to make the vast, messy, spaghetti-like complexity a bit easier to understand. So I'm looking at this picture, I'm just drawing out some clusters that seem to be important. It's a way of framing my thought. I know, I know. I don't want to frame my thought, but it's also a way of rationalizing what it is that I think I've kind of seen in the past. So don't take this as a theory. Take this as, yeah, I'm kind of drawing here, and this is what I drew. So syntax and theory, properly so called, go well beyond the concept of universal generalization, well beyond the domain of principle and grammar. There are many ways the past can resemble the future. The unknown or unseen can resemble the known or the seen. Forms, archetypes, we have the ideals of platonic philosophy. We have rules, we have logical syntax, but you could also represent those as operations, as procedures, of motor skills. What is grammar other than the act of speaking and writing? We could go beyond that. We could talk about patterns, regularities, substitutivity. Look up egg corns on the internet and see what you find. Fascinating, a whole domain of regularity which has nothing to do really with anything, but it's interesting. And there's similarities. I've written a lot about similarities in the past, relevant similarities, uh, convergence of properties, commonality of properties, commonality of features, as Tversky would say, and more. And all of these are the theoretical side of things. But then there's what all that means. There's how it relates to the world. We can have a theory. Is the theory true? What does that mean? There are different ways a proposition, a regularity can be true about the world. 
There's uh, the Tarski's theory of truth. Snow is white. The sentence, snow is white, is true, if and only if, snow is white. Which is a magically recursive way of doing it, isn't it? Because how do you know that snow is white? Well, you go out and you look and you record snow is white. So the sentence, snow is white, is true, if and only if the sentence, snow is white, is true. Uh, which has always struck me as a bit of sleight of hand. Other theories of truth, other theories of meaning, refer to the purpose, the goal, the objective. These are, are concepts that play a significant role in education. There's sense and reference, connotation, denotation, interpretation, the different ways you can understand mathematics, logic, language, probability. There's association, the learning theories that inform how our minds actually work, Hebbian association, Humean contiguity, uh, Rommelhart and McLennian back propagation, and Boltzmann or Sun Tzu theories of harmony. There's decision theory, this, uh, decisions and decision theory, voting consensus emergence, and this is this whole idea of science by consensus, science by popularity. It's a real thing alongside truth, snow is white, if and only if snow is white. And then there is the use actions or impact of all of this. And again, we come back to Wittgenstein's idea that meaning is use. When we think of speech and language, language isn't just representation, it is also action and interpretation and more. J.L. Austin and John Searle talk about speech acts, doing things with language assertives, directives, commissives, declaration, but also, as we know today, harmful acts, harassment, bullying, and more. The stuff we do online can be a real thing. And that's the pragmatics of language, the pragmatics of science. Interrogation and Heidegger and also um, Bassman Frassen, the whole concept of Putting assertions into your questions about the world falls under the heading of pragmatics. By asking a question, you're making somebody else think that something is true. Why, says the politician, why do you believe that we should have a $20 billion carbon tax? See what's happening there? Cognition, the mechanisms the manipulations that we do with our thoughts, observations, words, artifacts, and more. I've broken those into four major categories. Again, it's another one of these nice, neat slicing and dicing. Description, definition, argument, and explanation. All four of these play a role in science. All four of these play a role in research. They may involve theories. They may not involve theories. But the, the act of using them is a part of and constitutes a part of research and isn't the objective of research. Context, placement, environment. Here we have explanation. You know, what is it to explain something? What is it to infer to the best explanation? You read people like Hansen, Van Frassen, and Heidegger to ask for the ex explanation why X is to presuppose the range of alternative possibilities to X. It's a source of a lot of humor. Um, you, you can ask, you know, why is the grass green? Well, because of chlorophyll and all of that. Or, you know, or why is the grass green? Well, because blue would have been aesthetically unpleasant. Uh, you know, when you ask why this, you're asking why not that. And as soon as you say that, you've brought that even though it's not true, into your world of possibilities. It's become part of your theory, part of your frame. Meaning is part of context. Context is part of meaning. Vocabulary, here we have Derrida. Uh, what does a word mean? The meaning of the word is encompassed in the range of alternative possible meanings. What is the meaning of the word blue? To me, the meaning of the word blue is as one of or maybe the 30 or 40 colors. Uh, the meaning of the word blue to Andrea is one of the 200, 300, 500,000 colors. 
her meaning of blue is much narrower than my meaning of blue. And of course, all that brings in frames and lay off of worldviews. Change, again, coming back to Lao Tzu and the I Ching. Change and flow and directionality, progression, logic, all of these things become part of scientific theorizing. All of these things become part of the outcome of scientific theorizing. All of this to me, all of these are, are they're not aspects of reality, although they could be. They're aspects of the way I interact with reality. To, to see me as conducting an experiment, doing observation, and seeing what the results were would be an incredibly simplistic understanding of, of what it is that I do. I see the world, and this includes the digital world, as this grand tapestry that I'm exploring one word or one artifact at a time. And I'm exploring it in terms of these six dimensions, these six aspects of literacy. These six aspects of literacy do not define what I'm doing. They represent kind of what I've discovered so far out there. And that discovery informs my other discoveries. That discovery now leads me on, you know, it's like following the coastline. And this is what I've seen, and this is what I think learning is, and this is what I think knowledge and discovery is. So given that, let's see where this takes us. There's not a theory. Connectivism is not a theory. The proposition that we can use networks to understand the world is not a theory. It's a theory only if you, can, if you think it can be more universally applied. But if it's just what you're doing now, if it's just your reality, your paradigm, and your worldview, in your context, in your workplace, in your environment, it's not a theory. It's something else. So for me, science is like riding the waves. Uh, it's, it's like being a da Gama or a Diaz and trying to find what lies beyond that horizon, whether it's dragons, in which case you turn back, uh, or gold, in which case you keep going. And the methods you use, the ideas that you follow, the concepts that you come up with are all temporary. They're, they're uh, contingent, they're jury-rigged, they're scaffolding, and, and the intent is to take you this step further, to take you this step further. This idea of coming to this deep, finite, conclusive understanding of the world, the theory of all education, or whatever, to me just doesn't strike me as realistic. I think there will always be new things to learn about the world because we will always be changing and with every change we undertake we get a new way of seeing the world and it's in the seeing of the world that we get these new discoveries it's not so much 21st century science properly so called it's almost meaningless to think of these things as science, like, you know, some guy with a microscope in a lab anymore. It's almost like 20, 21st century languages. You think of physics as a language, geography as a language, biology as a language, computer science as a language, online learning as a language. And all of the skills, all of the understandings, the concept, the knowledge, properly so-called, are actually languages understood in terms of those six dimensions. You don't learn a language, you discover it. And to discover a language isn't to be told about it, it's to be immersed in it, to speak it and to listen to people speaking it. And you don't, you don't have these theories of languages, well, you do, but you know, you're, you're so badly misled when you do. I before E except after C. That's a theory in language, but 
English speakers know how often that theory turns out to be wrong. It's like the sidewalk disappearing under you. My scientific method, if it can be called that, is I come into the office each day and I immerse myself in the world, literally immerse myself in the world. In my case, it's a digital world. You know, I have the screen in front of me and, well, my phone, which I've left in my car again, <laughs> and, and my other digital stuff. And I immerse myself in that world. And these literacies that I've described, these are aspects of what I experience in that. And I move forward, iteratively, and I try to do stuff, iteratively. And what I do is communicate it to other people, to the rest of the world. I don't position myself as the expert. I don't position myself as the person who will know the, the right answer. I see myself, I, as the universe of discourse. And I don't try to frame the I in some sort of reference. I is just what I am, what I experience. I'm not trying to theorize about the world. I'm just trying to do things in the world. And if there is a theory, if there is an understanding, if there is a knowledge about the state of the world, it's not going to be something that I discover and express in a sentence. It's going to be something that emerges, something that's created socially, collectively, through the interaction of myself and my colleagues. And we've seen that in my work. I've seen that over and over and over again. What do you think connectivism is? What do you think the MOOC is? What do you think even online learning is? And all of that, all the stuff that we've talked about over the years, is stuff that isn't discovered by a person, but that emerges through the interaction of myself and other people who are making and doing and creating and, and not theorizing about the nature of the digital world. And this is not just what I'm doing. When we look at the wider world, we see that it's a galaxy of disunited, disparate, non-reductionist, non-bound by a single universal theory, a whole bunch of, a whole range of different disciplines. And as Feyerabend would note, each has its own method, properly so called, and of course it's underground methods, and its business methods, and its authorities, and its structures, and all of that. And if there is a thing called the world, and our understanding of the world, as a whole, it is the result of the interaction and communication between all of these different aspects, these different subjects, these different people working in these different disciplines, not sitting there theorizing about them, but actually with their hands in it, doing it, whatever it is. Social work theory is based on the work of social workers who actually go into these communities. Nursing on the basis of nurses psychology, physiology, agriculture, all of these disciplines are learned by people who ultimately get in there and work with their hands, with their minds, with their bodies in this discipline. I work in the field of online learning and digital research. I'm a little dot on this map. And, and my little dot doesn't tell me about the whole world, it doesn't even tell me about my part of the world, it's just me doing and interacting with all the rest. The beauty, the wonderful thing about this is sometimes I get a glimpse of this whole galaxy. And when I get a glimpse of this whole galaxy, I get a sense that there is a galaxy. And, and that in itself is a discovery worth making. Thanks everyone. I'm Stephen Downs and uh, I'm available for questions.